Welcome back to the final science class. We are live. This is exciting. The way this works, as you should know by now, is we start with the question, and then we have three clues to help answer that question. Today's question is how do you survive a five mile fall with no parachute? And there's so much juicy science packed up into this. So we're going to get right into this. First, a very quick announcement uh, as to why this is my last class, because a lot of people have asked. Um, and I would say, for starters, I wanted to do this class if we rewind for three reasons. One, teaching high school physics is my dream job, so I wanted to try it out and see if it really was cool. Um, the second is it, it gave me a chance for some mastery learning. I gave a TED talk on the Super Mario effect. I'm like, I'm just going to try this. I may totally fail, but it'll be fun to get a little bit better. And then the third is I didn't want to be completely absent during this whole thing. Uh, so it's just a way to be a little bit more present. So addressing those three things, basically, uh, I've loved it. It's been really fun. I still want to teach even more so now. Uh, the second thing, I've learned a bunch. Hopefully, you look at the first class versus this class. This one should be a little bit smoother. Uh, I, I personally feel like I've learned a lot. And then three, things have stabilized a little bit with this whole crazy coronavirus situation. So I feel a little bit more comfortable pulling back. So why not keep doing it? The biggest thing is it just takes a lot of time. I want to do it right. I want to give you guys something good. Um, I'm still making my monthly videos. I've been getting up at 6 a.m. for the past two weeks working on this next video, which is going to be really crazy and fun. Um, and then uh, it's just kind of like uh, it's given me a new opportunity uh, from teaching this class. There's an opportunity I'm now working on in, this, in the background that has to do with teaching that all will be coming in the future at some point, that you guys will be available to you guys. And then the final thing is this has sort of been a bummer with the coronavirus, but the positive thing is my schedule is cleared. And I really have enjoyed spending time with my family. And I didn't want this to be a situation where it just came and went, and I just felt like I packed my schedule with stuff like I usually do. I really want to take advantage of this. So to be fair to my family and to me, and I'm really enjoying it, I just kind of want to pull back a little bit. Um, but I'm doing great mental health. A lot of people are like, are you OK? Yes, I'm great. I'm doing all the things as much as possible to keep both my physical and mental health in a good spot. And I really hope you guys are too. That's really important. You got to hang in there. We can do this. OK, on to some science. How do you survive a five mile fall with no parachute? I'm going to start with a riddle. You're an astronaut. Congratulations. I can do that. I worked for NASA, so I can just grant that. You're an astronaut. You're on the International Space Station. Something needs to be fixed. Someone hands you this hammer. You go out there. You're fixing it. Suddenly, you realize you forgot to tie your cable to the space station, and you're slowly drifting away. What should you do? And if you're like, oh, you should just do one of these things where you swim back to the space station, that won't work. And let me show you why. This is an astronaut. They, they got him right in the middle. And your center of mass does not move. You have absolutely nothing to push against. You can't do anything. It's like being in the middle of a, a frozen lake, right? No matter what he tries, there's nothing he can do. He can barely push against the air molecules, which is like what he's trying to do. But if you were actually outside the space station, you wouldn't be able to do that. So remember, you're holding this wrench. And so holding this wrench, what can you do? Maybe you figured it out already. You want to throw it in the opposite direction. Why do you want to do that? Well, our buddy Newton came up with the law about this, Newton's third law, equal and opposite reactions. So by throwing the wrench this way, that's going to make you go back this way. Now, the wrench will be going fast because it weighs less. And you'll move back a little bit slower, but you actually will move back, which is why having a gun in space is actually kind of useful. There are oxidizers, so it will fire. And, uh, you fire it, you'll go the opposite direction. So if you wanted to go that way on the moon, you just like poof, fire that way, and you're like, Psh, you just fly up. Um, so, whoa. A few weeks ago, we talked about inertia, which is like how much stuff a thing has, right? How hard it is to move a thing. So momentum is just that inertia in action. That gives us our first clue. Maybe you've heard of this word before. Momentum, oh yeah. I got to throw this. Ugh. Momentum, mass times velocity, OK? 
It's like inertia, mass, velocity, moving. Um, so there's this thing called conservation of momentum, which is really helpful. That's what's happening with the wrench in space. Momentum of that system is conserved. So by definition, if you throw this, you got to move that back, move back that way. So they kind of cancel each other out. This is true even with, let's say, you on the Earth. You're like, yeah, Mark, if I jump up, technically if I hit the ground, I, the Earth should move down a little bit if momentum's truly concerned. And here's what's wild. It actually does. The Earth moves. The thing is, is you are such a tiny wrench compared to this big, massive Earth. It throws, goes that way, and it does move ever, ever, ever so slightly the other direction. So this is a true law that holds true everywhere. Now, where else is this used? <laughs> Balloons. You've blown one of these up before. So you should know very well what's going to happen if I let this go. I'm going to do my best to hit the camera. That was a poor job. A balloon, you have all this pressure. It's pushing air molecules out that way. And so by definition, hammer whoosh, out the back, the balloon conservation, conservation of momentum has to go the other way. This is how rockets work. You can't use a propeller in space. There's nothing to push against. So rockets are literally throwing hammers out the back of a rocket, and that makes the rocket go in the other direction. Of course, there it's a chemical combustion, and you have gases that are expanding and moving out that way. And by definition, whoosh, the rocket's got to go the other way. Um, so there's even an engine. And by the way, in a second, we're going to get to this thing where I'm breaking all these glasses with a CO2 cartridge. Uh, right after this next thought, we're going to do that, which is probably going to be a bad idea, but we're going to try it anyways. They even have ion engines. Now, ion engines are something we use in space. You're freaking throwing electrons. They don't weigh very much, but you have so many, and you're putting them out so fast. Because of conservation momentum, it moves this thing forward. Some of our, our farthest space spacecraft, like Dawn, are, are being propelled by ion engines. It's literally electrons being shot out. Now, do you know the farthest object, man-made object, in the whole solar system? It's actually something called Voyager. This came from JPL. It is uh, 13 million miles away. And if you're like me, 13 million miles doesn't mean it's moving 11 miles per second, by the way, which is fast. Think of something 11 miles away. In a second, it moves that fast. It's the farthest man-made object ever. To help you get a sense of scale of what that means, if the sun were a soccer ball like this and the Earth were a BB, and that is the correct scale, how far out do you think the Earth orbits around that sun? I asked a bunch of people this question, and in general, I got answers about like this or this, maybe some like this. It's not their fault, because that's kind of how they're drawn on these scales of the solar system. So I actually did a video about this. Uh, I'm going to show you a clip from this video to help us appreciate how far away Voyager is. So if you retain nothing else from this video, just remember that Earth is the size of a head of a pin, and it's at the 26-yard line. And as the final rocky planet, we have Mars at the 40-yard line, also a fleck of pepper. And now we start to see bigger gaps. At more than a football field away from our sun, we have Jupiter, which is the scaled size of a grape. So then, eventually, I kind of summarized. I went through all the planets with scales. Here's the summary. Which is also the size this of is a Neptune, the And orbits planet. around our sun the size of a soccer it's ball. A nearly eight football fields Out away. there in the distance, you can see the soccer field. And this view should help you appreciate the difficulty in accurately representing both the size and distance between the planets in a single image. OK, so before we get to the new ninth planet, let's recap. So we've got a pepper flake at the 10 yard line for Mercury, and then a pinhead at the 18 yard line for Venus, and then another pinhead for Earth at the 26 yard line, and then a pepper flake for Mars at about the 40. And then of course the asteroid belt, and then we make it to Jupiter, which is a grape at about 135 yards. Then we cross the street to get to Saturn, which is a grape that orbits at about two and a half football fields around our soccer ball sun. 
Then we double our distance from the sun to get to the seventh planet, which is a P at five football fields away. And finally, at nearly eight football fields away from our sun, we have another P, which is Neptune. And now we've laid the framework for under- And so that Voyager spacecraft I told you about, which is using normal propulsion, it's propulsion, it's not actually using ion engines, but the point is it's really far away. It is, you see this distance here, it's five times the distance of Neptune to the sun. So on this scale, it's like two and a half miles away. Five times this gap right here is how far we've sent it. And what's so cool about it, this is a picture of it when it was flying by Jupiter, obviously an artist rendition. This was made at JPL, which is really cool. On it, we have something called the golden record. And on that, it has instructions on how to play this record. There's a needle enclosed in this. Here's directions to where we are in our solar system. Uh, it has some basic information about atoms, and then on the back it has sounds of the Earth. And in here you can decode it and there's pictures of the Earth, uh, it has music, it's really cool. Uh, Carl Sagan had this to say. He said, the launching of this bottle into the cosmic ocean says something very hopeful about life on this planet. If you need a good science hero, Carl Sagan's your guy. Um, What's also cool about that is even at the speed it's traveling at, 11 miles a second, it'll take 40,000 years before that little message in the bottle is to our nearest neighbor. So 40,000 years from now, someone may find that and be like, wow, this is so cool. It's a record of our civilization, no matter what happens here. Um, okay, let's do something super not advised in a live class. Let me tell you the setup we've got here. Things are about to get real. This is a CO2 cartridge. Um, I've got a, it, it goes on this little track right here. We've put a nail on the front. It's gonna hit these glasses. We're gonna see how many glasses we can break. And at the back, we've got duct tape kilt Ken here. He's got the view of the house. Um, he's coming back for a guest appearance in the last one. Now, why am I doing this? Well, this is jet propulsion. This is rocketry. This is conservation of momentum. There's all this pressurized gas in here. It's going to shoot out the back. Hammers in space, right? It's going to throw some hammers. We're just going to move this in the opposite direction. Potentially very quickly because it's lightweight compared to all the particles that it's going to be shooting out with the pressurized air. Okay, so, so much could go wrong here. Uh, let's just see what we can do. All right, so I'm going to count down. Three, two, one, then I'm going to hit this little nail, which should puncture the back of the CO2 cartridge and send it that way. I might flinch. We'll see. Okay, here we go. Three, two, one. I'm terrified. That didn't work. <laughs> okay. Sometimes it takes a couple tries. Here we go. Three, two, one. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> All right, again, oh, I've sort of bit my nail. Hold on, check the alignment. Okay, I just need to hit it harder, I think. Okay, try it one more time. Three, two, one. Uh, give me another nail. All right, I do have footage from this morning when we tried this out. Do we have the replacement nail? Uh, we don't have a replacement nail? Okay, where did I just throw that one? I will show the footage. Let me try. We're going to try once more with this current nail. Hold on. Okay. All right. I'm not giving up. Okay. Line it up. Here we go. I'm really going to go for it now. Three, two, one. Am I hitting it? Oh. We actually did puncture the back. It must be a bad cartridge. Huh. Do you, uh, give me a new one. <laughs> we'll get this. Uh, do we have a new cartridge here? Um, we'll try it once more. I'll try it. This one just wasn't full, so I was concerned that maybe they were old. 
Um, all right, here we go. We're going to give it one more try. Otherwise, I'll show you the video of uh, how we did it this morning. Um, let's see if I can puncture this. Oh, I kind of bent the nail. Um, Um, all right, well, uh, here's what we're going to do. We're going to move this out of the way. We might try bringing it back at the very end. I'm going to have my buddy Josh here try and fix it. And uh, we'll see if maybe at the end we could get it going. Uh, in the meantime, I will show you what happened and the face of my reaction when we tried it this morning. Here we go. Let's see. Actually, not this one. Right here. This is science. OK, it punctured. <laughs> and the reaction. So like I said, it can't be dangerous. We did modify the system. So this is what we changed it to. Here it goes. Is there sound, Alex? So that could be what happened. We made some changes to make it go even faster, uh, which hopefully we'll be able to show right at the very end. Uh, but. OK. Here we go. We're live. Uh, what, that's actually probably not such a bad thing, because it was going to make a lot of glass. So if all the glass comes at the end, that may work better. Um, OK. So you have this momentum, right? Something's moving fast. How do you stop it or even get it going? Now, that's a fancy word. Oops. That's a fancy word called impulse. Impulse is force times time. Or it's, it's the change in momentum, basically, right? That, that's going to sound a little fancy. Don't worry about that. Here's, here's a demo we're going to do now. We're going to bring this sheet in, if you can help us out, Josh. I've got an egg here, right? And I'm going to try two things. One, I'm going to throw this egg against this wall. And then after that, I'm going to throw it against the sheet. And I want you a different egg, because foreshadowing. It may not survive the wall. In physics terms, I want you to tell me the difference between these two things. OK, you ready? Here we go. Now, make a hypothesis on what's about to happen. I can throw this at maybe 30 miles an hour. Here we go. It broke. OK, keep that in your brain. We're going to do another one right here. Here we go. I'm going to move this here. OK. All right, I'm going to get another egg. Clearly, this is, this is a different egg. All right, you can see me. Here we go. I'm going to throw it right here. Same speed. OK. Didn't break. Physics. All right, help me move this out, Josh. And you're kind of like, all right, Mark. Big whoop. And I threw that pretty hard. I could throw that as hard as I want. It wouldn't break in the sheet. In physics terms, what do you think is the difference between those two? It's the same speed. Well, the difference is, in one, uh, the time was very short against the wall. Whereas in the other one, the time was big, and therefore the force was small. These are indirectly proportional terms. So if one goes big, the other's got to go small. If one goes small, the other's got to go big. In the case of the egg hitting the wall, what was small? The thing that was small was my time. And therefore, force had to be big. In the case of the sheet, the thing that was big longer was the time. Therefore, the force was smaller. Here's another way to think about this. You can see right here, I've got this little stick. Let's say that represents the force of the molecules holding this eggshell together, right? This is the impulse. The total number of blocks can't change. It's the same. At any point, if you spike above this line, the molecules, the forces holding together the eggshell, you're going to break the eggshell. OK? But what you can do is if you can flatten the curve along this axis is time, if I can take, I take those same amount of blocks. I can't get rid of blocks, but I can take them if I rearrange them. So now the event just takes longer, look what happens. I'm underneath this line now, right? I stay beneath that curve. I flattened the curve. And as a result, the egg survives. There's no moment where it spikes up 
and gets bigger, okay? We're kind of narrowing in on what the answer is. Um, so, then why the heck do we have airbags in cars, right? Keep this in mind. What do airbags in cars do? Well, they extend the time it takes for you to stop, as opposed to hitting the steering wheel really fast. Therefore, what happens? Longer time, you flatten the curve, you stretch this out, the force is gonna be less, right? Where else do you see this? Long jumpers, when they're jumping, do they land in asphalt? No, what do they land in? Sand. Well, what's the deal with sand? Well, all sand does is it lengthens the time, stretches it out, of the event, the change of momentum, the impulse to happen, to go from moving fast to stopped, right? How about with your phone? Even the difference of dropping your phone on like a wooden floor versus a marble floor, which is gonna break more? Well, going back to this right here, this is the, the strength of your iPhone, of the phone's glass holding it together on marble, you're just gonna get the spike. It's gonna, it's gonna happen shorter because it's harder. Whereas even wood floor, which seems pretty hard, it's enough of a difference, fractions of a millisecond, that keep it below the line and it won't break. Parkour, right? People do parkour, they jump off crazy things. What do they do? They roll. What does rolling do? Well, that extends the time for which you stop versus just stopping yourself. In fact, if you bend your knees versus locking your knees, it's like 10 to 20 times less force just by bending your knees, jumping off something versus keeping them locked. Check out this clip right here of this guy jumping off this roof. That seems insane, right? Just thinking about it. See here, he ripped his pants a little bit. <sighs> but what was the trick to making that happen? Time. He slid down the roof, which allowed him to lengthen the time for the event to occur. Even cars, they used the thought was like, oh, we should make these as strong, as rigid as possible. Really rigid, like steel. Don't bend at all. Turns out that's the wrong thing. Because the time is then short, and it's like <sighs> you hit really hard. Now Cars are designed to actually crumple. They crumple and crush. All it's doing is extending the time, and as a result, so many more people live through car accidents than they used to. Okay, what about this principle in the opposite? Where's the case where you might want to have a high force? How about with karate, if you're breaking a wood board? This is why you shouldn't chicken out if you're trying to break a wood board, and you should follow through, because you want to hit this spike, as quickly as possible, because if you do that and you break the board, there's nothing left. You actually get to cheat and not have these there. You have a momentarily, you know, it hurts your hand just for a second, but once you break it, there's nothing left, right? The worst thing you can do in that situation is chicken out, so you get right up to this line, and then you stay underneath it. Because then it's like, oh, all that energy is going to your hand, where if you were just committed to it, you could have really quickly broken it and be done with it. Another example, here's a rubber hammer versus a metal hammer. Now you wouldn't think it makes such a big difference, but this is more effective at hammering in nails, except for in the case mine apparently, uh, because it's harder. So it's a shorter time, bigger force. You want to use a rubber nail if you don't want to like damage something. As little as that seems to make a difference, that tiny little difference in stiffness, means that the, the length is just a little bit longer. Um, what if you want to increase your momentum, right? Uh, so let's say you're hunting or whatever, bow and arrow, target. If you pull it back just a little bit, you really want the more time as possible, force times time equals your change in momentum. That's why pulling it back is better. You have more time for it to be under force of the string you're gonna have more momentum for your arrow. Same with like a gun. A longer barrel 
means it will go faster because it just has more time to be under the force of the gases coming out. It'll, a, a rifle goes faster than a handgun. Um, yeah, uh, also with sports, golf, tennis, whatever. The reason you follow through is you want to extend the time you have against the force. So anyways, I could go on, but the point is I love this when one little nugget, one little equation, just one little you know, mental model to have in your brain can explain so many things uh, in the real world. So, clue three. It's all about time. And that's what I want you to remember this, right? It's about the time it takes for the event to be slowed down is proportional to how much it hurts. So, when we're talking about how to survive a five mile fall with no parachute, what are you thinking? Just somehow, you don't want that to be an instantaneous end. How can you lengthen out the time? Well, this actually happened. A dude fell from 2,000 feet. His parachute failed. This is him right here. Uh, his name is Paul Lewis. This is in 2009. He landed on the roof. His parachute failed. He landed on the roof of an airplane hangar. And it was one of those metal, really flexy roofs. And he ran it in, in just the right spot. And the time was long enough for the de deceleration that he didn't even break any bones. Uh, he, he did say after that he wasn't going to go skydiving again, uh, which I really can't blame him. Um, and then, specifically for our answer, there was actually a guy who fell from five miles, and this is the clip right here. Five miles up, he's got no parachute. Check out what happens. And the crowd on the ground looking up, they have a visual on him right now. So he used a net, but you really could have, you could have used anything, right? You could have used a platform with rockets. You could have had rockets on his back. You know, that's where people do, you could use packing peanuts. Anything to just extend the time for him to land. He chose to use a net. So uh, if you want to know how to survive with no parachute, just figure out some way to extend the time. Maybe take a big, big, big bucket of packing peanuts. Um, okay. So I'm going to leave you with a final thought, all right? This is it. And it's to stay curious. Uh, before I get into this final thought, though, you can come back to me, Alex. Uh, we're going to try this one more time. I've been informed from my massive uh, quarantine-level crew here of three of us that we may be in good shape again. So we're just going to try it. If it doesn't work, just know that I still love you. Um, uh, but if it does, then it'll be heroic. Okay, here we go. Uh. <laughs> All right, so let's just see what happens. All right, don't be mad at me if this doesn't work. This is live. This is what you get. This is what you pay for. Here we go. Three. I'm waiting for the camera guy over here. Okay, here we go. Ready, Josh? Good? Okay. Three, two, oh, eyeglasses. <laughs> Safety first. Okay. Three, two, one. Duct tape kilt Ken is looking great. His, his kilt fell down a little in the back, but other than that, uh, yeah, we're in good shape. So there you go, duct tape kilt Ken. That was amazing. <laughs> my heart is totally racing. <laughs> okay, my final thought is to stay curious, okay? Um, we will have science class here, but every day can be a science class for you, all right? The key to that is observation. If you're observing the world around you and just makes you thinking about things and wondering and asking questions, you have Google, you can answer these questions. 
I love to think of things to talk with with my friends who love to talk about these types of things as well, just random questions. So if you don't have someone, to find your tribe. As you got online, find people who like to talk about this stuff, especially science stuff. I just want to give you an example of this. I've got um, driving in the car. I have my laptop down here because I knew it would get glass on it. We can go to the laptop screen, Alex. So driving in the car, here are a couple questions. You know, I was just thinking, what's an example of what I mean by stay curious? Let me just give you some questions that I've thought of in the scenario of being in my car. All right. What, why do these rail, why do signs like this have these holes at the bottom? You ever thought about that? Have you ever even seen that, right? So step one of the scientific method is observing. Why is that? It may have to do with crashes. I'm not going to tell you the answer to these. I want you to wonder yourself. Why do some of these trucks have these little doors on the back? What's the purpose of those cute little doors? I'll give you a clue that tends to be refrigerated trucks. What's the purpose of these things? Have you ever even noticed them before? They're actually pretty common. They go around the nuts. Uh, what might those be for? Again, this is sort of a safety thing that makes visually a uh, useful safety check. How do, how do they know when, people, uh, when cars are at lights? Someone told me once they have scales, and that never made sense to me. I, I wouldn't think scales. There's a different way. Maybe you've seen these cuts in the concrete. It has to do with induction and wires and current and magnetic fields. How are things reflective? A normal sign is on the left, but just with your headlights, these signs can become so, they almost like shine back at you, completely passive. It has to do with retroreflection. It's a real, all of these things are like Googleable. Hopefully some of these get your heart pumping and you're like, yeah, these are good questions. What's the purpose of these things? This actually has a lot to do with our, our class today, right here, okay? Clue is that they're filled a lot of times with water or sand. So, I'm gonna leave you guys with that. I will say for me, per, like even with my wife, she's an English major, so we make a great combo. And uh, you know, a lot of times I'll be like, have you ever wondered why? And she's like, oh boy, here we go again, right? So when we spend like a certain amount of time talking about nerdy stuff we got to talk about like feelings and stuff to keep it balanced conservation of, of conversation that's one of Newton's fourth principle I think uh, but uh, yeah or sometimes we'll just be like hugging or, or whatever we'll be like talking and there'll be like a lull in the conversation she would be like are you thinking about like your next video and you know sometimes I'm guilty like I get these things in my head and I'm stoked about them and I think about them and it's just like a great rewarding way to live life where you're curious about the natural world around you and you try and find the answers. Uh, so even though we won't have science class here, uh, you have science class in your heart forevermore. And hopefully what we've done here has helped instill that passion within you. So be good, prioritize your physical and your mental health, and I'll see you guys around on the internet. And as always, thanks for watching.